Okay, today we're going to look at reductive amination. So, reductive amination is a reaction that allows you to take an amine, such as a primary amine, so for example this, and it allows you to react it with either an aldehyde or a ketone, and produce a monosubstituted or a secondary amine as your product. So, it actually happens in two steps, and what you end up with is a secondary amine. And if you think about trying to do that regularly, well, if you try to put in a normal alkylating agent, so supposing we tried to put in an alkylating, alkylating agent like chloroethane or uh, bromoethane, so something like this, what we would end up with is over alkylation, we would get at least two substitutions and possibly a third substitution giving us uh, an ammonium. And that's not what we want. We want to substitute it once to give us a single uh, substitution, to give us our secondary amine. So the way that works is that it works in two steps. The first part is an acid catalyzed process to be produce an imine. And an imine, if I put it down here, is carbon double bond nitrogen. So it's a little bit like a carbonyl, except it's a carbon double bond nitrogen rather than carbon double bond oxygen. And it has some things in common with a carbonyl. And then we can take that, and like a carbonyl, we can reduce it from being a carbon double bond to a heteroatom to a carbon single bond to a heteroatom. So let's look at that in two steps. So I've cleared that up and I've redrawn two, uh, two substrates to react in this reaction. So we have an amine and I've redrawn it with an aldehyde just so you can see the difference between the two substituents. So this reaction is gonna be catalyzed by a small amount of acid. As it turns out, when you're making this reaction happen, you need a small amount of acid. If you put in too much acid, then you'll just protonate all of the amine and you won't get any reaction. And if you don't put in any acid at all, and you don't have enough acid, then one of the steps, or a few of the steps, don't tend to work so well, or at all. And um, let's just say they don't work, so your reaction doesn't happen either, you get stuck halfway through. So let's have a look at what happens. And as I always like to do, we'll have a look and see what a nucleophile, what's our electrophile, and what's likely to happen. And as you've probably guessed, your carbonyl carbon is going to be electrophilic and your nitrogen is going to be nucleophilic. And so we can draw that in, nucleophile attacks electrophile, breaks the carbon oxygen double bond and generates a tetrahedral intermediate. And that's gonna happen reversibly. So that's gonna go backwards and forwards, but when it does happen, what are we gonna be left with? Well, try everything that was in the last step uh, move those hydrogens over here for the sake of convenience. That's all there. That's there. That's there. One of the bonds, the oxygen is there. And the hydrogen is still there. And we took the lone pair of electrons and we put them in here. So this is now positively charged. And we took that pair of electrons, gave them both to the oxygen. Well, that can definitely go backwards. We could reform our carbon oxygen double bond and kick that out. But we also have a mildly acidic environment going on. So let's not forget our H+. In fact, what will happen is that there will be an equilibrium between protons on this side, on that side, and moving around. But what we want to do is get to a situation where the oxygen is part of the leaving group, and this is going to reform the carbon-nitrogen double bond. So let's start moving things around to make that happen. Well, the first thing we might want to do is add a proton onto the oxygen and see where we end up. And now I'm going to draw some bonds in here to make the next step easier. They're all still there. That hydrogen is still there. That oxygen is now sharing its pair of electrons with that hydrogen. So we've got an oxygen-hydrogen bond and the positive charge is still on the nitrogen. So if we add up all the charges, we still got a net plus one. What happens next? Well, again, this is all in equilibrium, but what's gonna happen next is that you can get proton transfer from the nitrogen over to the hydrogen. And this might not be the more favorable side of the equilibrium, but it definitely does happen. So if we give those electrons back to the nitrogen, and we imagine that there's another proton in the reaction somewhere else, that oxygen can pick up. These two things are gonna happen not exactly at the same time, but they are gonna happen. So we'll put them into the same step and we'll see where we get. So 
So what have we done? Well, we generated this acid, but we drew in an extra proton and we were counting out there, which we attached to this oxygen. So this oxygen now has a positive charge on it and we can stop thinking about that extra proton. We just call in one extra proton into this step to make drawing it out in one step rather than two steps easier. So what happens next? Well, same as every other step, let's just move around what's been moved around and leave everything else exactly as it was. That bond is still there. That bond is still there. I haven't moved any of that. We broke this bond, so we now have H2O. Water kicked out. We took this lone pair of electrons and we made a new carbon 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 nitrogen double bond. So let's put our positive charge on that. And now what have we got? Well we have an imine, but it's still got a proton on it. So if we want that as a neutral species, we're gonna lose that proton and that proton come go back and continue to catalyze that reaction. So if we look at that last step, what we end up with is an imine and our proton regenerated. And we've kicked out water. And like when we're forming an acetal, we want to put something into the reaction that's going to mop up the water to push the equilibrium from this side down to that side. And these imines are actually quite unstable. So if you were to put in any amount of water, or if you were to just leave them in water, they would actually, the reaction, the reverse would happen. So these are very easy to break down just by adding in water. So what good is this to us? Well, as I'll show you in a minute, in the next step, we can reduce that to make a carbon nitrogen single bond to give us an amine, which is a much more stable thing altogether. Which step wouldn't work without the acid? Well, when you get to here, if you don't protonate the water, this is never going to be a good enough leaving group to leave without, uh, without the proton attached because you're not going to be able to use that lone pair to kick out hydroxide. That's really unlikely to happen. It would be really unenergetically favorable. So you have to have the acid, otherwise you'll get stuck in this situation. And that's called a hemiaminal, which is an interesting name for it, but that's what it's called. And they are going to be in equilibrium with this if it's just a neutral solution in water. Okay, so on to the reduction. So now we have our amine, what we want to do is reduce it. And you can use very, um, very much any reducing agent to reduce this molecule. Uh, you could use sodium borohydride or lithium aluminium hydride. Lithium aluminium hydride might be a bit reactive, uh, might be a bit more than we need. But when we're doing this reaction, often it would be helpful if we could put in the reducing agent at the same time as we put in everything else. So if we choose a reducing agent that will react with this molecule, but not with our ketone or our aldehyde, then we can produce a selective reaction. And that way we'll get the product that we want with the minimum amount of fuss. So often what you see done is you see this reaction done with sodium cyanoborohydride, where one of the hydrides has been replaced with a cyanide. And cyanide's a very good ligand and it just reduces the activity of the uh, hydrides. It makes the boron less electron uh, poor and makes it less likely to interact with any given carbon oil or imine and only react with the imines. And so if we do that, we can selectively reduce this. And so essentially what we're doing is we're adding a hydride H minus from this side and this double bond will break and give the two electrons up to there. And this is going to look for a H plus, which will be floating around in the reaction because we're doing our reaction somewhere between pH four and pH six. We're doing it in um, mildly acidic conditions. And so this, if we follow all of that, if you accept that the hydride comes from the sodium cyanoborohydride and the H plus is in the reaction because we're doing it in mildly acidic conditions and we ignore this for now, it's not going to react with that. What we end up with is following all the same rules as usual. Well, we've added a new hydrogen on here, took that pair of electrons, gave them to this, so let's get a lone pair. Took the lone pair, 
and create a new nitrogen hydrogen bond and so we've made our amine and we've made a secondary amine which otherwise we couldn't do we couldn't do it by alkylation it also works so often it works you can use ammonia uh, to make primary amines from an aldehyde or a ketone sometimes you can do it with secondary amines but if you do it with secondary amines you get different intermediates okay that's all for now uh, if you have any questions post them below or ask in class hope that helps thanks bye